All right. Um, so as Kristen said, I'm a department chair here at uh, in um, at uh, the Department of Nuclear Engineering here at UC Berkeley. Um, that's a uh, picture of the skylight uh, taken from uh, the hills and with the Campanile uh, in front. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'm just going to talk for uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes here about uh, our department. Um, Okay, so that's the uh, the Doe Library uh, there. Uh, uh, the um, campus was, uh, UC Berkeley was founded in 1868. Uh, we just had our 150th anniversary about five years ago or so, uh, five years ago. Um, and uh, it's a very nice campus if you haven't been here. It's a large school, um, about 45,000 students and about 2,000 faculty. Um, and it's a very broad scope university. Um, I think the university prides itself or the campus prides itself on uh, comprehensive excellence in everything having to do with social sciences to uh, classics to, um, you know, uh, medieval French literature to physics to engineering. Uh, it's a, um, a, a, a truly a, a very a broad scope uh, university. Um, <clears throat> what, so long the agenda here. Um, the nuclear engineering department <clears throat> is now, uh, let me do the calculation, uh, 65 years old. It was founded, I think, in uh, 1958. Um, it, it was founded in a context of um, uh, Berkeley being uh, uh, the uh, very much the cradle of nuclear science in the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, a number of very uh, iconic uh, figures uh, uh, really shaped the uh, nuclear science here at um, Berkeley in the early years. Um, J. Robert Oppenheimer, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, was um, went to do graduate work in Cambridge and Göttingen in Germany in the 1920s and was there right at the, you know, the birth of, you know, uh, quantum mechanics and then came back and he was a, a theorist uh, and he, um, in a sense, brought the new physics back to the United States and uh, trained, um, you know, uh, the, the, a new generation of, of, of theorists and, of course, later on went to become the um, you know, the, the director of the Manhattan Project, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later. Uh, Ernest Lawrence um, uh, invented the cyclotron here at Berkeley in uh, 1929. Um, and uh, his little cyclotrons, which went from a few inches up almost exponentially in very short time to massive, a very, very large uh, uh, machines for accelerating protons and uh, other ions and ultimately heavy ions, uh, uh, the uh, actually precipitated the founding of what is the first Department of Energy National Laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is just on the hill uh, to the east of the campus. So if it's a, uh, you know, from our building, a 10 minute brisk walk will get you up into the laboratory there. And it became the pattern for all the other DOE labs. We'll talk about this a little bit later on. Um, and uh, uh, as you may be aware, uh, this was also the hotbed for the discovery of uh, super heavy elements or heavy elements uh, beyond uh, uranium. Um, <clears throat> Glenn Seaborg uh, was the first to create uh, plutonium, and then uh, with the accelerators at Berkeley and uh, nuclear chemistry, um, uh, which became a very uh, sort of special discipline of, of Berkeley, um, many, many, many chemical elements came out of, um, uh, uh, out of Berkeley, and that continues um, unabated. Um, so the department was um, founded, <clears throat> uh, as I say, up says here, 59. Tom Pigford, who I actually knew when I taught in the department uh, long ago, was the founding chair. 
Um, and uh, it was one of the first original six departments uh, in, in the country. Um, <clears throat> here are the three people who were really men of history. If, if you are kind of a student uh, uh, of the kind of the history of uh, the role of Berkeley in the Man Manhattan Project, the founding of Los Alamos and the, uh, um, you know, the development of the atomic bomb, there's Ernest Lawrence Oppenheimer and then Edward Teller uh, who was the uh, father of the super, um, the uh, therm uh, thermonu thermonuclear weapon, the hydrogen bomb, uh, were all professors here at Berkeley. You can walk around town and see the houses they, they, they lived in. Um, if you're a movie buff, you're, you realize that coming this summer, they're releasing a new uh, a, a movie. Uh, I'm not a uh, uh, kind of a movie aficionado, but I, these are apparently, this is an all-star cast. Uh, uh, here, Kenneth Branagh, I know, because he's a Shakespearean actor uh, and a director himself, uh, but that's Christopher Nolan, and in July, uh, you'll actually see uh, a lot of footage uh, of UC Berkeley as part of this movie. Uh, the uh, I was actually walking around on campus about a year ago when they were doing some of the filming, and I was wondering why I was seeing people who uh, were wearing suits that were older than mine uh, and old cars, and then I quickly figured out they were shooting a movie uh, there. there. <coughs> They, uh, they were just not college professors with, uh, on a, with a low budget wardrobe. Uh, anyway, uh, keep your eyes open for that. There was the Trigger Reactor. The building we are in, the Echeverry Hall, uh, was uh, purpose built to house on the ground floor a, uh, I think it was a two megawatt reactor um, of uh, one of the Triga series by General Atomics. Um, and um, it was um, uh, in existence for about 25 years and it was removed in 1990, um, but it enabled uh, a, a very uh, broad program of uh, education and research. Uh, when I was a postdoc, you know, many years ago up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, um, I used to come down and uh, uh, work with some of the faculty here uh, were doing experiments um, uh, in, the, in the trigger reactor. After the reactor was removed, um, then that very large hall, which is, um, if you have visited here or, or will visit here, you will see it's uh, about um, <clears throat> uh, 100 feet long, about 60 feet wide and 40 feet high. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a, one of the best laboratory, uh, best laboratories or most unique laboratories on campus, uh, where all of our experimental faculty and faculty from other departments who have sort of synergistic activities, um, you know, can have a very large amount of space for doing very specialized experiments. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory which came about when Lawrence's cyclotrons outgrew the campus and President Sproul just suggested he move up the hill and uh, where we'd have lots of space for his, you know, large buildings and, and shielding, the requisite shielding and infrastructure. Um, uh, that, that was in a sense, the seed crystal for what became uh, the entire DOE National Laboratory System. Um, uh, next, of course, during the Manhattan Project was Los Alamos up in the, Northern New Mexico in the Jemez Mountains. Um, and, but then uh, now, um, uh, and then not long after the war, Lawrence Livermore National Lab is a peer laboratory to Los Alamos, uh, very close by. Um, uh, you have um, within proximity of, of our campus, um, not only have Los Al uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Lawrence Livermore, but you have Sandia National Lab, the California branch of Sandia, which is a very large laboratory, the largest DOE laboratory in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But there is a part of the of the of Sandia lab across the street from Livermore, where about fifteen hundred people work. And then south on the peninsula, you have the uh, the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory um, <clears throat> there, which is a photon science, uh, formerly a high energy physics lab, now a photon science lab. Um, uh, utilizing the LINAC and the storage rings uh, there as well. Okay, 
Um, just some things that you might be interested in. We actually, our department actually owns, uh, uh, I remember it was a, these were kind of exciting days in my early days as when I came to Berkeley the, to serve as chair in 2012. Um, we received a, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I got a phone call from Phil Broughton, a uh, radiation technician, um, uh, safety tech, um, uh, uh, and saying that he, they had in the hazardous waste revetment a little cigar box <clears throat> um, and uh, with a typed note from Glenn Seaborg in there and a little plastic box with an eyepiece uh, and uh, <clears throat> that uh, purported to contain the world's first macroscopic sample of plutonium that was created uh, in the cyclotrons both here at Berkeley and at Washington University in St. Louis. And then in the summer of 1942, um, that after uh, uh, irradiating massive amounts of, of ore, uranium ore, uh, they were able to create whole cloth, an entire new chemistry that allowed them to precipitate out plutonium um, uh, of um, the 2.7 micrograms there on, on the, the tip of a very tiny piece of tweezers. It's about the size of a flake of pepper. That's why you need a little eyepiece to see it. Um, and um, one of our faculty, uh, Rick Norman, and a, a student of his and a uh, uh, research engineer of his actually did gamma ray and, and uh, x-ray uh, analysis of, of the plutonium, um, uh, the, the activity from plutonium, and was able to establish that it, they, what they measured was consistent with that. They measured 2.3 plus or minus 0 0.4 micrograms. Uh, and it was consistent with plutonium that was about uh, 75 years old or so. And this made a big news splash. Uh, and I think in the fullness of time, will be put up in a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, showcase over in Gilman Hall in, in the College of uh, Chemistry where uh, Seaborg did his uh, first separations, uh, his first studies on plutonium. <clears throat> this is our faculty. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the people uh, you'll be able to work with. Um, uh, we have uh, going clockwise from the top. Um, let me get my little tennis ball here. Um, the um, let's see. There we are. Um, Professor Peter Hosman, <clears throat> very distinguished, uh, very prolific uh, person in the area of, of uh, nuclear materials. Um, and uh, has a very large operation with many, many students. Um, he's now running a uh, advanced manufacturing center called Manufacturing 360 um, with a very heavy emphasis on additive manufacturing uh, and, and uh, worldwide uh, collaborations going on, not only in the US, but with uh, scientists and engineers around the world in Europe and Asia. Uh, Carl Schroeder, um, is uh, also a scientist up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and is um, uh, sort of a theorist, but also a leader of this relatively new field of um, a new paradigm for accelerating particles using uh, what's called a plasma wake field uh, acceleration, where you actually drive a plasma wave in, uh, uh, in, in a, um, uh, in a uh, gas, a very dilute gas with a high-powered laser, and then the electrons will surf, gaining um, very large amounts of energy um, in just a few centimeters, even GeV type energies in a few centimeters. And there's a very large center up, up of the hill called Bella, and uh, our, some of our students work there. This is Max Fertoni, who will become chair in, on July 1, um, who is, um, does sort of innovative designs of uh, reactors. Uh, Kai Vetter. <clears throat> um, uh, who is a uh, professor here. He's uh, a joint appointment again with Lawrence Berkeley Lab, who's a, a world leader in um, uh, nuclear radiation detection and particularly gamma ray imaging and uh, uh, very innovative um, applications of gamma ray imaging. Um, a lot of his um, systems uh, fly on drones, little quadcopters, where they take optical imagery uh, and meld it with uh, gamma ray um, 
spectroscopy and imaging at the same time. So you can overlay um, you know, optical imagery with imagery taken in the gamma domain, uh, which uh, enormously multiplies the information uh, content uh, to images. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is applied in everything from nonproliferation to medical physics uh, to the civilian nuclear reactor uh, uh, world as well. Para Peterson, uh, uh, it, it, it was trained as a mechanical engineer, is a very distinguished person uh, in the area of thermal hydraulics. Um, uh, he served on President Obama's Blue Ribbon Commission for America's Nuclear Future. Um, and uh, uh, he and his students started a company many of you may be familiar with called Kairos. Um, see how we're doing on time here. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, which um, has raised a lot of capital. Uh, they now have multiple sites around the country for research and production, and they're going to be building a uh, demonstration reactor in Oak Ridge called Hermes. They already have the ground uh, ready there and, and some preliminary approvals uh, to move ahead. This is of the molten salt, um, uh, 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 the high temperature molten salt cooled reactor of which Pear is one of the uh, pioneers of kind of the, of the new designs, uh, you know, um, it's old concept going back to the 60s, but but really took on a new life in the early 2000s uh, of, um, of, with uh, Pear, Paul Picard, and Charles Forsberg at MIT. Uh, Raluca Scarlett has been with us about uh, four or five years, um, and um, she is a um, uh, kind of a world leader in molten salt chemistry and has set up a very uh, nice lab uh, downstairs where uh, they're actually able to work with real uh, high temperature materials, FLIB uh, as uh, you know, very um, uh, promising coolant for these uh, molten salt cooled, uh, these new design reactors. Uh, and she has also a very large group. Uh, Ed Morris uh, was our person in fusion. He is retiring, but will continue to teach. He's retiring July 1. We hope to be doing a search for a uh, fusion person. Uh, either in inertial fusion, i.e. like NIF or um, uh, magnetic fusion. Um, uh, this coming year, we have uh, requested a search authorization from Central Campus. Uh, a lot of interest, huge amount of interest on prospective students um, in this area of, and for um, obviously quite good uh, reason um, uh, there as well. Uh, Jasmina Vujic um, uh, is the principal investigator of uh, the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium, um, and uh, the, she, uh, which is now in its third five-year cycle, it's been uh, immensely successful. Um, the um, uh, the uh, it's funded by the NNSA, the the Nuclear Science, uh, the uh, um, the Nuclear Security, uh, the nuclear National Nuclear Security Administration. Um, and um, it's a was the first of what are now four consortia. Uh, Berkeley is leading one of these consortia of, of about 10 universities and five national laboratories to train the next generation of experts uh, to enter uh, the Department of Energy labs for the nonproliferation mission uh, or related federal service. Young Ho So uh, is uh, uh, professor in residence from UC San Francisco, which is a premier, world premier uh, teaching and research hospital. Um, we've been had a long research relationship uh, with UCSF for the longest time, uh, going back, you know, a couple of decades at least, and um, are now recently getting a um, CAMPEP, uh, uh, we're waiting for CAMPEP approval um, for a um, um, you know, to uh, um, to accredit, um, you know, get to accredit our program such that people can enter into residencies um, in medical physics programs as well. Um, this is a big and growing area of the department. Uh, you'll be hearing from Rebecca after me, and I hope she is able to talk about her own work. Uh, she's a, a premier uh, nuclear chemist with applications um, 
particularly um, you know, with a heavy emphasis on uh, sort of radiation oncology, pr production of uh, radiation, uh, uh, radioisotopes for cancer therapy. Um, she runs a very, very large operation up at the lab, a very large group, the Glenn Seaborg Center as well, uh, as well as having a, uh, a, a uh, taking on very uh, significant responsibilities in our department as well as the vice chair for undergraduate studies uh, and the MENG program. Uh, Lee Bernstein uh, is a uh, leader in the National Nuclear Data Program. He's a, a very distinguished nuclear experimentalist. Um, um, and uh, again, with a very large group, he is also a joint appointment between the laboratory and uh, campus. Um, uh, that's the current chairman. I'm a sort of a physicist of a rather basic stripe, but I do a, kind of a wide range of, of uh, sort of applied physics studies as well. Guan Yu Su joined us January uh, 1 uh, from MIT, um, where he was a student and a postdoc, um, and uh, is um, uh, sort of representing the next generation of people studying thermal hydraulics uh, here in our department, uh, and is setting up um, uh, a, a, a kind of a hot loop uh, for studying of, of these molten salts for future reactors. And Bethany Goldblum uh, will be joining us uh, July 1 uh, as an associate professor. Um, and uh, she is the executive director for the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium. Um, okay, we have um, uh, several other people uh, who uh, uh, work, with our, work with us or teach with us, for professors emeritus or people who are uh, lecturers or, or adjuncts uh, as well. Uh, there's our wonderful staff. Uh, you're going to be very well taken care of here. Um, we have um, very good connections with the private sector. Um, uh, there is Mike Laffer, who is a student uh, of Pears, uh, who is, um, you know, was the founder of uh, Kairos and um, is the, um, I think, the CEO of Kairos. Uh, uh, as well. That's, they, they're now employing close to 300 people in Alameda, Albuquerque, North Carolina, Ohio, and uh, Oak Ridge. Um, we have very close relationship um, with a company that uh, is now growing. It sprang out of UC Berkeley Department of Physics, uh, Richard Muller and Elizabeth Muller called Deep Isolation, which is using fracking technology or the, the technology developed in fracking over the past half century. Uh, for what may be a, a very kind of inspired way of doing uh, deposition of nuclear waste with the ability to recover it. Um, below is a, uh, someone we're extremely proud of, a former member of our faculty, Rachel, Rachel Slaybaugh, came out of Wisconsin, was a Rick Hover fellow, uh, worked at the Bettis Atomic Power Laboratory, um, uh, is, was really very much of a visionary and, and kind of the Kind of the the in a certain sense projected to the new generation what the new nuclear was all about. Uh, she was then sort of called to Washington to be the first nuclear uh, program um, director in ARPA E, Advanced Research Project Agencies Energy, uh, where she ran a hundred and fifty million dollar portfolio um, in getting um, sort of innovative startups going in the nuclear domain. Came back, she was. The director of an incubator, uh, you know, for incubating new companies, uh, high tech companies coming out of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and then has actually joined a uh, venture capital fund with a strong emphasis on green energy, which has really been very much the theme of her career. And um, there's the NNSC of, of uh, all our partners uh, who work with us, um, uh, universities and national laboratories. Uh, and an, an amazing record of, you know, of, you know, we've trained, I think, uh, uh, very hundreds of students of which nearly half have actually gone on to careers in the DOE labs or related federal service, which is, in, in fact, what well, the intention of the founding of the consortium model by the NNSA, you know, the semi-autonomous part of DOE uh, responsible for nuclear security. And I think what I'm going to do there's my picture of NIF. Um, 
Um, I'll take questions, and if not, then what I will do is pass uh, the baton over to Rebecca. So please, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and so I can see everyone again. And I'm um, anxious to take your questions about uh, anything, including the MNs program. If not, over to you, Rebecca. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. So I will just go through some information, details about the image program. Um, and so this is a presentation that Kirsten put together. Uh, I'm assuming you can see the slides and hear me. Um, so welcome to this this. Uh, Hour of Nuclear Engineering, um, the virtual visit for the MNG program. As Carl introduced pretty much everyone in the department, um, this is who we are. So Max Fratoni, who is becoming the chair of the department, um, was the lead for the MNG program in nuclear engineering until recently. And I will be uh, becoming your contact information for the MNG program. Kirsten Wimpohall, who's uh, on the call and who you probably have been talking to quite a bit, is also uh, is our uh, student services advisor and is um, the most helpful resource in the department for, for the program. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, and so I'll go quickly over hopefully uh, some information that you've seen in uh, various flyers, handbook, and uh, descriptions of the image program. But as far as nuclear engineering is concerned, um, to successfully complete the image program in nuclear engineering, you'll be required to complete 25 units of coursework, um, take and pass a comprehensive exam, and participate in a capstone project. So those are the basic requirement for the image program. Uh, when we look at the 25 units of, of coursework, there are three areas. There is the core leadership curriculum, which is uh, eight units total, and that will be taken care of or really under the umbrella of the Fung Institute. So not really necessarily within the department, but more within the college and, and the Fung Institute. So we will let you explore um, these courses at the Fung Institute. Um, we also have 12 units minimum uh, as a requirement for uh, technical electives in, in nuclear engineering and then five units for the capstone project. Um, our schedule for the fall of 2023, so the first semester of next year's MNG program is, is already online and available and you can start signing up for classes. Um, so it's listed here. Those are example or those are core classes in nuclear engineering that you can take for the nuclear engineering specialization units. Um, and so they're listed here. You can access them to the Berkeley catalog. Uh, you can also um, talk to us about each class if you have any questions, but they will cover most of the topics uh, that that we offer in, in terms of technical um, electives in the department. Um, so, and, and they are scheduled so that you can, if you uh, wanted to, you can attend all of these classes, take all those classes. Um, I will point out that you want to make sure some of the, these classes are cross-listed with upper division undergraduate classes. Um, you will want to make sure you take 200 level classes for the image program to satisfy the requirements. So if you have an option to take, for example, um, a 120 or 220 M course code, you will want to focus on the 200 series uh, to make sure they fulfill the requirements. As far as, uh, so the leadership curriculum, as I just mentioned, um, this is administered by the Fung Institute. So you will want to refer to their guidelines for more details. Um, in terms of the technical specialization, um, so I, I did mention that you want to uh, complete a minimum of 12 units and they have to be at the 200 level and they have to be taken for a letter grade. And I don't know if you can see my actual, okay, here is better. Um, 
you cannot take the following classes uh, for the unit requirement. Um, so N299 and E299, for example, are research units. Um, you are welcome to take those classes or to enroll in some of those classes, but they will not count towards the requirement. So this is additional. Um, so 295, 298, 299, and 375 um, would not count toward the requirements. It's not dancing. Okay. Um, all right, for the capstone project units, so those five units uh, minimum, uh, that will be a total minimum uh, of five units over the two semesters, so fall and spring. You will enroll in the Engineering 296 MAB session, um, uh, going uh, with this scheme here, with one to two units in the fall, three to four units in the spring, um, and all of these classes will be graded at the end of the spring semester. So once you complete the capstone project, uh, we will talk a little bit more about what it takes to find a research project and to complete it. Um, and in general, for the course requirements, so leadership, um, nuclear engineering electives, and the capstone projects, um, you are required to hold a minimum GPA of 3.0 or higher. Uh, in order to successfully complete the program. Um, and we do have a comprehensive exam that you will need to take and pass. Um, so those are details. You will be provided all this information separately, um, but um, this is really to, to ensure that you have a basic general knowledge of the field of nuclear science and engineering. This um, exam will be 90 minutes long. Uh, it does have questions on various topics related to nuclear science and engineering. Um, the content and the level of the questions are um, can be linked to materials covered in this textbook here. Um, this is available online through the University of California Library, um, so not nothing to uh, acquire. But you can you can use this as a resource to prepare for the exam. And as it is scheduled, you can also. Um, talk to us. Um, there is a second component in the comprehensive exam that is devoted to leadership topics. And again, that will be administered by the Fung Institute. Um, so you would want to talk to them for this. Um, if you do not have a background in nuclear engineering, we would encourage you to enroll in the Nuclear Engineering 200M Introduction to Nuclear Engineering class. This is given, it will be given in the fall of 2023. Um, and um, that would be helpful to prepare uh, the technical portion of the comprehensive exam. Uh, if, if students do fail that comprehensive exam, there is a chance to retake it during the spring semester. Okay, and so um, once you're in the image program, you also have the opportunity to focus on um, one of four technical concentrations. We're looking at nuclear reactor design, management, and infrastructure, or applied nuclear science and radiation detection, or nuclear materials and manufacturing, or medical physics. Once you select a concentration, uh, you are encouraged to select classes and projects that are related to the concentration. Um, and so we can also go through the next couple of slides, which have recommendation on the classes for each concentration. So I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. There is not much time, so I would rather um, focus on questions that you may have. But uh, again, this is going to be made available afterwards. So you can um, take a look at all of the classes that are um, suggested for each concentration. As far as the capstone project goes, um, this is a nine month experience. Um, it is intended to um, integrate technical and leadership skills and uh, make sure that you have the opportunity to work in a team of students uh, with a research advisor and, and complete uh, a project uh, that provides engineering solutions to um, important problems in, in nuclear engineering and engineering in general. Um, we have capstone projects coming from various Berkeley faculty, but also industry partners. Um, and so they will serve as technical advisors, so research advisors for the teams. Uh, and you will have some time to decide what to, to choose the project uh, in the fall. If you do 
decide to choose a project outside of those um, provided by the nuclear engineering department, um, then you will you will need to provide some kind of written request to myself uh, to make sure um, you know your choice is motivated uh, adequately and that also this project is somehow related to the field of nuclear science and engineering. Here are some examples of capstone projects from last year, um, all from nuclear engineering department. So for example, here um, developing machine learning algorithms for nuclear fusion uh, magnet material science. We also have nuclear reactors for space applications and so on. Um, currently, we're looking at eight different projects for the fall of 2023. Um, they will be listed soon so that you can start thinking about your interests. Um, a word on diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, and belonging in our department. Um, those are principles uh, that we are strongly trying to abide um, by at the University of California, but also on the Berkeley campus, within the College of Engineering, and within our department. Um, we want to um, embrace diversity as really a source of strength and um, ensure that everyone uh, in the department is, is welcomed uh, at the student level, staff and faculty level. Uh, we, we do have uh, uh, members of our community from all backgrounds and, and we do want to ensure that everyone um, feels respected, values, valued and, and um, is able to evolve in a inclusive working and learning environment. Um, so there's a lot of resources that are available if you were to encounter any issue uh, or if you wanted to think a little bit more about this. Okay, so we, we have two uh, uh, alumni from the MNG uh, program in nuclear engineering who are on the call and who will also be talking to you in a um, um, short moment. Um, and so I will stop here and ask if there are any questions. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering what the track record of um, MNG students into, you know, both the PhD program at Berkeley and other PhD programs uh, was and, and kind of maybe what the split between like career focused and academia focused uh, uh, goals are coming into MNG. Um. Sorry, can you repeat that for a second? Um, track record in terms of, of career path after? Uh, yeah, so I guess it was two questions. One, one track record in terms of uh, masters of engineering students who then go apply for PhDs. Um, and second, like what is the proportion of people who are looking to go into a PhD versus people who are looking to go into a career in nuclear engineering? So I can answer the question about the students um, continuing on. So. Um, over the last couple of years, we usually have maybe one to three of the MN students that continue on to the PhD. Um, Chai and Christopher are two of those people. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, in regards to where MN students go after the program, um, I'm not sure of all of them. On the Fung Institute's website, though, there is um, a, um, a page that lists where nuclear, where nuclear engineering MN students have, have gone, people that have disclosed that information. Um, and so I will try to look it up before we're finished here on the call and put it in the chat, the link for that. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, thanks for the question, Benjamin. Um, so I think it really depends a lot. Uh, for example, when I did the MNG program, our uh, capstone group, we had six members. And out of these six members, Chris, who's also on the call, he was also in the same capstone as me. Both of us ended up coming to Berkeley to do our PhD, but five out of the six people in that group ended up doing their PhD. Um, it's just the other three uh, people went uh, to different universities. And I think what it ultimately boils down to is the type of capstone project you have, as well as your um, advisor, because some capstone projects are very clearly uh, industry motivated and kind of put your foot in the door in terms of industry. Other capstone projects are more geared towards research and letting you explore a little bit what the field has to offer. Our capstone project, you know, it was um, based on 
irradiation on fusion uh, magnet materials, which was a little bit more research-based. And I think that ultimately helped us, um, at least most of the members in our group, uh, eventually pursue a PhD, whether it be here at Berkeley or elsewhere. You know, we had someone go to the Imperial College of London. We had someone go to University of New Mexico. And I think we had another guy go to University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and then Chris and I are at Berkeley. So again, it just really depends on the capstone project, industry versus hardcore research. And honestly, there's a lot of overlap. So don't think like, oh, I either have to pick one or the other. It's kind of what you want. And as well as like the kind of advisor you have, if you feel like your advisor is more connected with the industry then and you're interested in that, I think that's a better option versus a lot of the professors in our department are really closely connected to national labs, which you know, if you're interested in research and pursuing a PhD, that might be a very viable option for you. So I hope that answers your question. Perfect. Yeah, that was exactly what I what I was looking for. And it kind of ties into, um, you know, I had a really good question about the capstone projects. Um, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, there's a huge variety. I think, you, I think you mostly answered my question, but I was wondering, like, for the more research oriented ones, do they tend to be more like, you know, survey paper expository, like just kind of, you know, rehashing the state of the field, or is it more like participating in, you know, frontier projects that are, you know, the, the professor? No, uh, maybe I can, maybe, maybe I can answer this one. Um, yeah. Okay, so hey, uh, Benjamin, um, I'm Chris. Um, like Chai mentioned, um, I uh, did a more research oriented capstone. Um, and that has spun into, so I'm also, uh, it's, uh, I'm in a pretty interesting position where I not only finished the image program and transitioned into a PhD, but now I am myself running two image programs. Um, and these are very much uh, uh, cutting edge experimental type um, uh, research projects that uh, will lead to um, publications. So it, it is it is not just review stuff, it is active uh, research. Um, and I am uh, currently e actually facilitating some of my own students transitioning to the PhD. So um, there is definitely um, research um, oriented directions that you can go uh, based on the, again, like like Chai said, the, the project that you that you take. Um, so there are options. It's 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 um it's a uh, sort of uh, bifurcated in that way. Typical. Cool. Thank you so much, Chris. Oh, you guys have any other questions? Anything? You know, we have a few more minutes, I think. Hello, Chai. This is John. Hey, John. Hi. Are the magnets working towards pro propelling something? Um, you should you should ask Chris about this because it's his current PhD. I would love to Hi, answer, Chris. but I think you should ask him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it's it's um it's the it's the magnet materials for initial uh magnetic confinement fusion, not initial confinement fusion. Um. Basically, the magnets is the the thing that's suspending your plasma, and that's the plasma you hope to get, you know, a net gain reaction from. Um, that's that's the that's the magnet materials we're working on. Okay, thank you. I have a lot to learn. No, oh, yeah. If you have any questions, um, definitely ask away. Uh, I will make a quick comment. Um, the capstone projects are extremely important in my opinion to the whole you know especially for uh in our department so i'd say uh for other departments i've talked you know we've had the um privilege of talking to like mechanical engineers uh biomedical students and they don't put as much emphasis in their capstone decision making process they're just kind of sort of happy with you know whatever project rolls along the way i think for our department's a little different you should really narrow down what you want out of this program and figure out which capstone project that is. And if you need help doing that, you can always reach out to us. You know, you'll get the capstone list. And, you know, if you're like, hey, what do you guys think about this? Well, how do you feel about, you know, this advisor? This is the direction I want to go to. And we can hash something out. You know, it's not a big deal. It's, uh, but I will say, please make sure you pick a capstone project you're happy with and that will potentially get you to where you want to go. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the advice.
Kirsten, I have a question for you. Okay. The 200M intro course this fall, do you happen to know when that's being offered? Uh, let's see. Um, give me a second to look it up. I, I didn't do the scheduling this time, and so it's not on the top of my head. <laughs> so on, on my schedule, it looks like it's on Tuesday, Thursday, 9.30 to 11. Yes. Thank you, Rebecca. Yes. So it's also online. If you look at the Berkeley um, academic guide that's online on, a, on the Berkeley website, it lists all the courses for fall at least. Thank you. Sure. I have a question for Chair Bi Biber. I, Van I Biber. Before. How do you say it? Van Biber. Van Biber, Chair Van Biber. Hi, this is John. I had a question to, uh, maybe you could follow up on two topics. One was the, the person Schroeder who worked on plasma waves. Uh, again, the same question, did that work towards something that's moving through the air, something that's being propelled? Uh, in that case, uh, what they're doing is um, they're, um, this is a new paradigm for accelerating particles um, uh, in to replace what currently are, for example, at Stanford, like the two mile long electron linac or very large cyclotrons or the large Hadron Collider, large circular machines. The idea is to make them more compact by um, rather than using a RF microwave cavity that feels there to push an electron or a proton um, to um, uh, get the electrons or protons to surf a plasma wave with a, with a much higher energy gradient. Um, and so therefore to make the wave compact. So you're driving it not with microwaves, but a laser beam that drives a plasma wave. And then the electrons are being are, are basically surfing on this electron wave. So in this case, you are getting something to move, but they are particles that could be used uh, uh, for medical therapy. Uh, today you have these Varian and Siemens and others makes these uh, Clinacs, these small six or so MeV electron Linux that they use for cancer therapy, either directly as electrons or crash them into a tungsten target to make a beam of gamma rays for um, uh, treatment, uh, basic science, industrial processes, and so forth. Thank you for that explanation. That's terribly interesting. I, I also had a brief exposure with Brian Spears in the inertial fusion energy group. I found him to be exceptionally helpful, and he led a group of high performance computing and artificial intelligence intelligence advisory council conference at Stanford. And if if I can put in a vote for new chair of the fusion project, if he if he's applicable, he was great. Brian Spears, thank you. Uh, just the last one since we've got two minutes left. Um, I guess Chris left, but Chai, uh, what did you think was the most difficult part of the uh, MNG program? Um, and in terms of classes, uh, do you have any, uh, any, any, any to particularly watch out for? Um, anything to review over the summer? <laughs> um, honestly, if you don't have, like, to be honest, I was a physicist coming in. I had very little background in nuclear. I did accelerator stuff before coming here and it's nuclear related, but it's nothing to do with what I'm doing currently. I, I think the 200 level class, uh, the 200 M class is a fantastic introduction to the field. And um, it does a good job of essentially giving you the basics and uh, allowing you to thrive in some of the other classes because the concepts taught in that class are essentially like the building blocks that they start off in almost every other class they teach beyond that. Um, it, the, honestly, the hardest part about the whole program was um, everything came in waves. There were times where it felt like, you know, I had, I was a little like, all right, what am I doing right now? I'm just taking classes, I'm learning. And then there are times where I'm like, oh my God, there's like a million things going on. My capstone uh, deliverables are due. You know, I have this XYZ class. So I, I'd say it's more of like the, the wave uh, aspect of it, it's the, the busyness comes and goes, but you're always doing something. And uh, yeah, I'd say that was like one of the trickier parts to navigate, but I think after the first semester, it kind of settles in and you 
find your foothold, you can make some progress in your capstone. That's when it starts really feeling good, in my opinion. Nice. Yep. Sounds, sounds like an exciting year. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love the MNG. Ours was cut short because of the pandemic, but you know, I think everyone is very social. Everyone is very open to learning. And most importantly, everyone wants to grow. So I think it's um, a very nice environment for if you want to just figure out what's going on in the world and what, I guess, future leaders, quote unquote, are trying to do to make an impact on the world. So yes, from that aspect, I love the program. I think it's fantastic. Shai, if I may ask for a 10 second answer, uh, anyone do part-time versus full-time in order to go into the PhD? Is there a requirement in that, in that regard? Thank you. Um, I can't comment on that because I'm still a little hazy on the work to school situation. Um, I did not work while I did the MNG and I don't technically work as a PhD student despite my actual PhD work. So I can't, I would ask um, a, someone like Kirsten. Yes, yes. Yeah, so um, it's not a requirement. You don't have to be a part-time student to, to get into the PhD. We do have part-time students, um, not that many. Um, uh, maybe one or two a year. And so uh, the part-time would uh, enables you to take um, a reduced course load. So instead of 12 units, I think it's eight or as low as eight. Um, and it also um, extends the um, program time from uh, nine months to two, a two-year program. Thank you. And then that continues to be one capstone dispersed. Right. Two years. right. Thank you. So you do your capstone usually your second year. How does that work with other team members who might be on the nine month program? Is it just you're kind of, you carry it on, you know, for, for the extra year? So I'm not, that's a question that the Fung Institute would probably be better able to answer. But um, from the way they have it set up, I would guess that um, if the student is a full-time student and is on the same capstone with the part-time student, that um, the part-time student's probably already been in the program for a year completing their coursework. And by the time they're in their capstone, um, they're able to devote that time that they have there just to the capstone instead of um, a full-time student would have both of those things they're still working on. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So, um, so it's my understanding that uh, so I know we do two technical uh, courses each semester, and one of those is supposed to be from our concentration. Um, so for spring 2024, so my concentration is uh, reactor design, management, and infrastructure. And 2024 uh, in spring, it looks like there's only one offered, and it's 215M. And I did undergrad at Berkeley for nuclear, so I already took 150, which is like the equivalent. So um, would I just choose another nuclear engineering one from like a different, okay. Right, so the concentrations aren't, um, they're not, it's not a hard requirement. It, it, they're just suggested courses that um, support that concentration. Okay. Um, it's possible we may add another course um, in spring, um, but as of right now, that's what the, um, what the offerings look like. Um, but yes, it's not a it's not a hard requirement that you have to take those courses. It's just a suggested course, and so yes, you could take another course in a different um, area. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any any other questions? Quick question: Any bridges currently between aerospace and nuclear? Thank you. That's, that would be maybe a Carl question. Um, thank you for asking that question. We're very excited about that. I personally played a, uh, uh, a role in the uh, original standup of, the, um, uh, of, of our engagement with NASA Ames uh, Moffett Field. You may know that we're actually gonna be building a campus down there, a 36 acre campus right on the NASA Ames site. Um, it'll be a public-private partnership. Um, uh, as a consequence of that, the College of Engineering did a study. There was a series of, of committees um, and that ultimately uh, ended up informing the aerospace program, which is currently uh, under the auspices of mechanical engineering, but is intended to be a broadly constituted 
um, from across the college? Um, and the answer is we have several faculty that are intensely interested in uh, space nuclear and so forth. Rebecca uh, has also served on, on, um, what, on some of these committees, and I would like to ask her to, to chime in as well. But the answer is we have intense interest in the aerospace program, and I think there are natural synergies there. If you wanted to come and do a capstone project bridging the two, I think that would be uh, all good. Great. Thank you for your answer. I have a lot to look forward to. Thank you. Rebecca, did you want to add in? Okay. I think the you know the focus on the capstone project is the right one. If you know right now, I can think of a couple topics looking at uh, resilient materials in extreme environments and their high irradiation that's related to space. Um, designing micro reactors for propulsion that's that's another area. Um, so there are a couple of projects that could be of interest in bridging the two. Micro reactors. A little Excited. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I don't know if Fung has anything else planned for for people today, or um, if it's going in different stages. I'm not sure exactly what their um, schedule is like. But thank you for coming. Nice to meet um, all of you, and um, yeah, hope to see you soon in the fall. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.